be one, you can lose your license. Whereas if I'm going and we're racing down the road and Grand Halloween, 220, all right, so we're racing down the road and I get stopped and you get stopped, I'll just get a big ticket. You'll lose your license. The law, and then you'll have to pay a lot more to get me in state. The laws of the state of Georgia say, well, that's because you're younger, you should know better. Well, is that differential treatment about honesty and truth or is it about power and politics? Because power and politics bind everything. But we're going to talk about the Constitution attacking the Supreme Court. And we're first going to, I'm going to ask you uh, to scan this QR code and here we go. Can they, will I be able to see that, JP, probably? Yeah, if you can, scan that and answer a couple of questions to see if you know what court packing is. And uh, what, what do you think about it? And then we'll get into court packing. They don't actually talk about the Constitution. I need a little bit from you. How do we get ourselves in this position? A little bit about American history and the like. Uh, I want to recognize one of our other people helping out. Michelle McFadden is new to the Alpharetta campus. She is our student life advisor. And you'll be seeing more of her around. I'd like to thank her for really working on this with JP and the others. Uh, and we'll miss Gabe Williams. Too. She might come in later. And I want to thank her for helping and spearheading this. I also want to do an advertisement. If you're interested in politics and pizza, and I think the same room, right? Yes. Tomorrow, I'll end, end with this, at 11 o'clock in the morning, we'll have a student-led discussion about pizza and politics. Though so the idea I foresee is maybe we can build a history of politics club here, as we do with some of the other campuses, where students can get involved and debate issues and discuss them. And do get ready for the kinds of things you might do in a city council, state legislature, or maybe even Congress. That's, that's an important thing. So that'll be here tomorrow at 11. Refreshments will be provided. And one of the first issues they want to talk about is student debt relief. We've got some students going, yeah, I got all that money. I have debt relief. Other students of mine have said, wait a minute, I borrowed money. I went to perimeter. I didn't go downtown. I saved money by not doing that. And now the others who, who borrowed the money instead of me paying for it, Get some, uh, government that's, a, that's a good question, but that's a good one. And we'll have other issues to debate. All right, have some of you already logged in and answered this? Lucas, has everybody else done that? You've already done that? All right, so let me get some results here. All right, so this, all right. So I do review answers? Yes. Ooh. All right. Do you know what court packing is? Yes and no. That's a kind of figured no. Um, do you support court packing? Well, a lot of say maybe and the like. So we've at least got some ideas. Do you know what court packing is and do, do you support it? And a lot of people maybe. I like to see that. I like to see that. What's really scary is I've looked at Gallup polls on this one issue about people knowing what court packing is. And a lot of them, it's, it runs about 30%. But a lot of people are for it. If you don't know what something is, why are you for it? And that's a, that's, that's a dangerous thing to find out about public opinion. You have all kinds of interesting, contradictory things. All right, let's go back. Those are the questions we ask. All right, what's the Constitution say about the structure of the U.S. Supreme Court? SCOTUS, Supreme Court of the United States. Oh. It's not the one I'm looking at. Shay, do you have any idea why that's not showing up here? Am I the look in the wrong one? There we go. Now we go to the next one. Thank you. All right, the Constitution actually says very little about the Supreme Court. Constitution says a lot about Congress, some about the presidency, but very little about the U.S. Supreme Court. And I'll get into why the Supreme Court is so powerful. It just says the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The judges shall hold their office during good behavior. What's that mean? You get a lifetime appointment. That's the only, that's what's great. When, uh, when, when I was in graduate school many years ago, somebody asked me why I wanted to be a political science professor. I said, well, I wanted to get tenure so I could have a job for life. And they said, 
You could just go to law school and become a federal judge. There are very few jobs in this world that, have, that are for life. And that's one of, the, one of the issues about this. How long do Supreme Court justices serve? What's your name? Man, do you know how long Supreme Court justices serve? Yeah, exactly. But do you know how many years most of them serve? You got it. That's good. You don't need to know the number. Yeah, the average, the average these days is about 25 years they serve. And it's funny because people live so much longer, presidents want to appoint people in their late 40s, early 50s, so they can get a good 30, 35 years out of it. That's one of those things. So it says, in all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers or consuls, and those in which a state shall be party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all of the cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction, both as the law and fact, with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. So we know the judges are appointed and are appointed for life. Inferior courts to the others, yes. That's a darn good question. Basically, what's been interpreted as Unless you get impeached, you're good behavior, and the, the Congress only impeach you for gross offenses, such as a bribery, um, tipping off your relatives that they're under federal investigation, those kinds of things. That's just happened to two federal judges where I grew up. Um, one, one, one got convicted of bribery, and he wouldn't leave. He was in federal prison, and he wouldn't leave, and the like. But that, that's because he was impeached in a little Yes. This court? This, yeah, I like it here. Yeah, it's a court, but I'm the one holding holding cards. You all get to be the jury. All right, next, next slide. Uh, what is court packing? It's simply changing the sides to change membership. Uh, the Democrats these days said, well, Trump, the Republicans got too much control of the nine members of the court. Nine. So let's make it fair. They got six conservatives, three liberals. Let's add three seats. Let's make it 12 or 13. And that has been talked about. There have been bills issued. By the way, it's just the Democrats who did this now. Our Republicans in the 1980s and the 70s who didn't like how liberal the court was proposed the same thing. Here's what's interesting. The president and Congress decide who is on the court. The president nominates and the Senate confirms the majority. Can you name the newest Supreme Court justice and tell me a little bit about it? Yes. She was a person. In February, eight, eight, uh, eight days before the election. No, no, that's no, no, you're missing that one. But no, she was confirmed. That's that was under Trump. I'm talking about the latest one under Biden. We'll get to Amy Coney Barrett. Yeah, uh, when she was confirmed just before the election. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was a justice well into her 80s, died. And so Trump said, I'm going to fill that position. And he had a Republican Senate to support him. And he did. That's a little bit different. That's not packing the court. That's just holding position. Well, the Senate Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, is incredibly good at running the Senate. He used it to block, uh, block an opening when Justice Scalia died and the like. Justice Scalia died, and he blocked the opening until they got a Republican president. Is that Paul Mead? Isn't he now like the attorney general? Yeah, he better call him the him attorney general, which, you know, I don't think there's any job better than the U.S. Supreme Court justice, but it can't be. I was the attorney general. So that's right. No, I'm talking about who's, who's the latest justice. She was nominated by President Biden last spring, confirmed. Yes. Yep, Ketanji Brown Jackson. So anyway, she was nominated by President Biden in the spring and was confirmed in, in the Senate in the spring summer. And she took office. She took office in July when Justice Breyer ret retired. These are big deals. These are big deals. Right now, you've got only three Democratic appointees and six Republicans. All the six Republicans are very conservative. The three Democrats are very liberal. What happened is with Justice Ginsburg, who you mentioned, when she passed, the, that seat was held by someone who's very liberal, passed the conservative. So people could. Well, and then Biden said, well, we now control Congress. He didn't say court packing, but a lot of Democratic leaders did. Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, then Speaker of the House, Majority Leader, the Senate. They suggested, well, let's create more positions. There's a precedent for doing it. But the president nominated Senate confirms. You cannot filibuster. This changed in the last 10 years. 
It's called the nuclear option. So, you know, the US Senate is a great talking body. Some of my students have over the years suggested that maybe I ought to be a senator since I talk too much. Uh, those of you, yes, I overran, I overran today. I apologize for that. But what happens is you have a situation where senators can just talk to block a nominee. That stopped. The Democrats, the Democrats are the ones who started stopping it, and then Republicans made it for real in 2017. Here's the thing. The number of justices has been changed in the past. In fact, it was done by John Adams' administration. We'll talk about that. And it was done following Abraham Lincoln's death in the battle and the battle of radical Republicans. And Marbury versus Madison, this is why the Supreme Court is so important. Chief Justice John Marshall, who got his position in sort of a, uh, a court packing plan, has written in the, one of the most famous cases, it is emphatically the duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. What's the problem? Who's supposed to make law in this country? What do they teach you as a kid? What do they teach you as a kid? What do they teach you as a kid? You remember? Who makes law? Congress, right? Congress wants to make law. Well, the truth of the matter is Congress kind of writes law, and the Supreme Court decides what's going on. That's what's going on. The Supreme Court is that important. Next slide, please. All right, a tradition of court packing. There's this wonderful article by a scholar I know, Joshua Graber. It's the Boston College Law Review, and he argues that court packing is actually an American tradition. It's not an aberration. It's not an aberration. It's not something that's happened occasionally. It was a failure and success. And uh, FDR's in 1937, I'll explain to you what he did. And if you want to know what, are the, what happened to the Democratic Party, and people talk about, oh, there were problems with the Democratic Party under Obama, under Clinton, no, it started under FDR. All right. In 1800, there was a presidential election. Do you know who was running? Does anybody know who ran in 1800? And uh, it was a rerun of 1796. Yes. It was Jefferson and Thomas. You got it. Jefferson won this time. In 1796, Jefferson came in second. And you know what they said he got? Vice president. Uh, they changed that after 1800 because it led to a mess. But for 1800, Jefferson ends up being president. It was, it was clear it was not going to be at it, uh, how they operated under the electoral war. However, the election was in November. They had clear results in December. And guess what? The president didn't change over till March 5th. So the Federalists, even though they had lost in November, stayed in office till March 4th. You know what they did? They created a whole bunch of new judgeships throughout the federal courts, a whole bunch more. And they created them, then the president nominated them, and they filled them, except for a couple that led to case law versus that. So all of a sudden, in 1802, so 18 dawns, and the Federalists, even though they lost control of Congress and the presidency, all these Federalist judges. And you know what the Jeffersonians did? They got rid of those courts. They just abolished them. So the first attack on, uh, on the courts and court tax didn't work. But there was success. After the Civil War, the Republican Party more or less controlled much of the United States that... Uh, where there were elections and the like. Remember, the South was under reconstruction. And the Congress and the president changed the number of seats. It was nine. They expanded, uh, I'm sorry, uh, they expanded it to 10 to get the people, one person they liked on. And then they shrunk it to seven. So as people left the court, they got what they wanted. And so in 1937, Franklin Roosevelt had won re election. He was elected in 32 and 37, and the Democrats controlled huge numbers of the House and the Senate. The Supreme Court, though, kept striking down legislation preferred by the Democrats and FDR. So what happens is Roosevelt decides, I know how we'll fix this. We'll, we'll get a helper justice for every justice over 70. By the way, justice has served now well into their 80s. 70 was considered real old then. And uh, when I first started teaching this oh, about 35 years ago, I thought 70 was old. Now, uh, I'm not close to 70, but I'm closer than I was. It's like, wait a minute. 
So the idea that Sui justice over 70, he would get, and there were only three liberals on the court, he would have gotten, and there were six conservatives, he would have gotten uh, at that point five more positions. Congress was like, no, no, that's too heavy handed. And then all of a sudden, the conservatives on the court who kept striking down FDR changed their minds. It's called the switch in time that saved the nine. And some of them started to retire. And then by the end of uh, FDR Truman, you had 16 years of Democratic rule. There was only one person who was not a Democrat on the court. And he'd actually been pointed by the Democrats. So court packing has failed a lot. But since this article, Trump adds three new members. You talked about Amy Coney Barrett. Yeah. So I want to well, that's it's, some of our textbooks talk about Brown versus Board and say, well, it's only FDR's court. Now, it was the Chief Justice who changed it, a man named Earl Warren, who was a Republican from California. And he's the one, being a Californian, he had a totally different view of segregation than most everybody else. He looked around and said, what's going on? He was actually a very progressive governor of California, Earl Warren. Um, he was so hated as Chief Justice Supreme Court that they had to have security ride with him and his children and grandchildren have talked about, uh, you know, driving around in a car and afraid they were going to be recognized. Earl Warren went to the same college that I did. He was in California. So uh, there's all these collection there about it. And I've read his recollections of his children, grandchildren, he was that. But th that was a little bit different. What changed is you had a new chief justice. And that chief justice had a very different perspective. And he was able to work with people. Look, don't you love when we professors make you work in groups? Yeah, most of you are giving me this pained look. There's a reason. You've got to learn to work with each other. That's very, very important because in the real world where they pay you, you have to work with people together. JP and I, and Jay, we all work together. And you have to get good at it. It's not easy. There's always somebody who didn't do something on, on the person who had problems. So anyway, since the article, and also by this presidential commission on SCOTUS, um, many, many in the media have said, well, that, that commission was there to describe how to pack the courts. No, it had nothing to do with that. It released its report. It was very long, very interesting for those of us scholars. Most people all talk about is new code of ethics and more court transparency. So it's kind of big. Like, well, Polarization is how do we get into this mess? How do we get into the idea that, well, we need to add members of the court to change how it rules? How do we get into this? Messes in politics don't just happen. What's your name? They don't just, something had to happen. There's usually some history here, right? What's your name? Well, we, some, somebody had to do something. Well, we've got something called polarized politics. People are very strong, either Democrats or Republicans. A lot of people are. There's nobody in the middle anymore. What American politics has mostly had over its history, and really since, we, by the way, when I was a kid, it was like this. It was very polarized, Democrats and Republicans. And politics, partisanship, and polarization. So polarization is we have two very strong positions. It's not just politicians. It's people are like that, by and large. And politics made it partisanship. People now realize, I know not all of you are traditional age students, but by and large, traditional age students are a little bit different. People don't have, some have strong views, but students are much more open. People tend to get older and they tend to get very hard political views. Uh, I had a mother-in-law who was a Democrat, although she disagreed with all the Democrats because when she grew up in the 1920s and 30s, all Southerners were Democrats. So it was like, wow. She was a Democrat, even though she disagreed with them because she had been socialized that way. That's something we'll talk about in my class and back to turn out especially get political socialization. But that's what's happening. We have very strong people, very conservative, very liberal. And they think of SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States, as a mini legislature. We don't have enough legislature enough, so everybody wants, let's let the Supreme Court do it. And by the way, Congress and the president do this all the time. We'll just write a law and let the Supreme Court interpret it. Well, that's a dumb way to do it. 
because you won't necessarily, did I step outside the camera yet? All right, I'll try not to do that. Uh, you don't want to really do that too much. Stay in, stay in focus, stay in focus. So what you have is a situation where Congress doesn't make a lot of laws. The Supreme Court used to decide over 100 cases a year. They maybe do 60 or 70. And second, the Supreme Court is considered the ultimate on everything. Just for example, so it's wearing masks. Uh, we've had the second president to, to tell us the COVID's over. President Trump said it was getting better, too. Look, when it's an election, COVID's over. You need people to vote for you. Uh, I'm just being a little cynical, but it's true. But we wear masks. They should wear one as I'm teaching. Uh, the Supreme Court had to weigh in on that. Can you require people to wear masks in certain areas, on airplanes? And... That's kind of crazy. We should make those decisions. Should the Supreme Court hear those kind of cases? They are a super legislature and the like. Presidents know that SCOTUS appointments are powerful tools. You can rally your partisans, control the court, and punish your opponents. One of the key things that happened by our Supreme Court term is the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade and said there is no right to abortion, so it's up to the states to decide. And different states are going in different directions. Uh, we live in the most conservative part of the country, it's the South. Uh, Georgia used to have the most liberal abortion laws in the South. In fact, that was Georgia was famous for that. It's not true anymore. But what happens is we keep talking about rights and the like. Now, the Democrats have used that to organize. Generally, in a midterm, for my students, you'll see this on the next exam, uh, actually, the next discussion question. Generally, in midterms, the party in power, that's the Democrats, they control Congress, the presidency, loses seats. The problem is, in the House, in the Senate, the Democrats have a marginal majority, just barely. So they lose some seats, the Republicans could be. And this seems to happen regularly. It happened before most of you were started in 94. Election 92 happens in 94. 96, the Republicans still controlled. But in 2000, the uh, Republicans controlled that we had 9-11. But we had a couple election cycles, the Democrats lost control. So that's what seems to happen. But the abortion case, overturning Roe versus Wade, has made the Democrats very energized. Of course, Republicans are also energized over inflation. So we have two political parties talking about two totally different issues. If you watch TV and you see, you don't even have to watch TV, you can look on your phone. On your feed, you're getting Republicans. Inflation's a problem. The Democrats, you gotta protect abortion. They're not even talking to each other. Do you understand? That's what polarization is. That's what I study. I study polarization in something that used to not be a big deal. And I'll get into that more. Is she in All right, the limits reform. Things you don't want to do. Bad things that have been tried in terms of reforming the Supreme Court, dealing with this, don't change the numbers. Why? It's worked once, it hasn't worked. And most Americans will tell you, and a friend of mine, Andrew Traeger, did a survey on this, and most Americans will tell you that there are nine members of the U.S. Supreme Court and that it's in the Constitution. He deals with perception of reality in the Constitution. Don't limit the types of cases. Well, Congress has said, we won't let the Supreme Court inside cases that, where we like their precedents. So in other words, the case said, well, she can't do that. The Supreme Court has been barred from hearing certain kinds of cases, and they went ahead and heard them anyway. There was a, a high-tech case that involved software. It's not supposed to be heard by the Supreme Court. It's only supposed to be heard as hard as, as it's a hard case, as they explain. It's only supposed to be heard as high as the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. You've probably never heard of it. But the Supreme Court took it anyway. But wait, you can't take the case. Congress said you can't. The Supreme Court said, and it was 9-0 to, to take the case. And also, don't do for, for the harm to the court's legitimacy. What do judges wear when they're on the bench? What do they wear? Black gowns, black robes. What else do people wear black gowns and black robes? Sometimes at funerals. Where else? Think something happy that you wouldn't have when you depart Georgia State. Graduation, yeah. When you depart, when you grow, when you walk out with your degree, it's an awesome feeling. It's an awesome feeling. You know, it's funny, I, I reflect back and uh, Getting the undergraduate degree was 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 that was that was much bigger than than the master doc. That was that was a big deal.
I still have the picture. Yes, I wore sandals. I went to the University of California, Berkeley, where Berkeley stuff. But yeah, that's a big deal. And I want all of you to focus on that. Focus on getting that degree. So you graduation, um, religious clergy members sometimes do. Uh, my dad was a judge. I have his robe. Some of you will see it. You can figure out who's a lot taller than me pretty quickly. Uh, it almost drags to the ground. But um, we think of it clergy members. Have, have any of you ever had an anthropology class? We talk about traditional society. All right, well, if you have Anthro 1102, we talk about traditional society in there. And one of the things they talk about is in traditional societies, the religious members, the clergy also make judgments on who's right and who's wrong about disputes. So you see kind of an intersection of both ideas there. So the court worries about legitimacy. Does anybody know what Congress approval rating is now? Just throw out a number so my students should know. We talked about this, they remember. Yes. How low? Yeah, it's around 30, 35. Hey, what happens if you get 35 out of 100 on your exam? Looks what happens. You fail, right? Uh -huh. Now, where's Biden's approval rating? Does anybody know where his is? 37, maybe 40. If he hits 41 or 42, the Democrats are probably going to do okay. You can use presidential popularity, and we as political scientists predict all kinds of things. Some of them have no basis in reality. We predict them. He'll do okay. All right. What's the court's favorable rating? Does anybody know what it is? Depends on you look. It's dropped to about 50%. It used to be 75, 80, 90%. The nine unelected people who sit there in black robes and decide our fate. And there's some real worry. Chief Justice John Roberts is very worried. He's the only one in the court who worries about this, and he's spoken about this. That there is the court's legitimacy. People have to believe in the court. At least you hope they believe. Because that's where all the big issues end up. Here's what's weird. We say we're a great democracy, and many of you have come from other countries. You know, the kind of democracies that had different things. We say we're a great democracy. Yet we let nine unelected people who wear black <laughs> make many of our big decisions. Is that a democracy? Well, that's how we do it. That's how we do it. All right, there's no place. Dues. All right, this is where I get a little wacky and throw some ideas at you. Let's create, change, and create laws that govern which judges sit on the court. I got an idea here. By the way, this idea is supported with a number of scholars in the law. SCOTUS members are becoming more diverse, not just race and gender, but legal background. Why was Justice Jackson such a refreshing and big change? Why? She's the first what? Black woman, African American woman, to be on the court. First African American man was Thurgood Marshall when I was a kid. Justice Thomas has been on the court a long time. The first black woman. And we talk about this all the time, how the court has become more diverse in terms of race and gender. Yes, it does. But warning, they're all lawyers. They all went to law school. What's that famous Shakespeare quote about lawyers? From one of the Henrys. Do we know that? The first thing we do, we kill all the lawyers. That's what they're talking about. That's the problem with law. And um, but it's also legal background. Why is Justice Jackson different from the others on the court? What what kind of cases has she got? Does anybody know what she's done? She was a judge before this, but anybody else know why she's why she's different? Well, she was a public defender. Well, you know what a public defender is? Somebody tell me what's a public defender? No, it's not pro bono. No, they get paid. They're public provided defense lawyers. When you get arrested, first don't talk to the police. Just just practical. Just, just don't do it. You're only going to make it worse. Give them their basic information. There's the right to remain silent. Use it. I too many students. Whether you did it or didn't, you get yourself in trouble. Be quiet. They tell you, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can will be used to get you in court of law. You also have a right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, one will be appointed. We have public defenders. Fulton County is public defenders. In Cobb County, where I live, they have a few of those, but really what they do is they appoint people. For criminal defense attorneys, when I can get this case, and then pay for it. The state, the state and county pay. But you have that kind of background. 
Somebody's actually done that. Um, but a lot of these, I mean, it's funny. How many members of the Supreme Court justice, how many Supreme Court justices are non white? Justice Thomas, Justice Jackson, Justice Sotomayor. That's three. That's three out of nine. About a third. That's kind of what it is in the country. How many are women? <laughs> Amy Coney Barrett, Justice Jackson, Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan. Four. Women comprise the majority of America. So it's looking more like America, but that's not necessarily what you get. Warning, just because, do you know what Congress looks like? Me. That ought to scare the hell out of you. That ought to scare you. Congress looks like me. It's a bunch of older white guys. Hey, it wasn't that long yet. It was 40 years ago. I was sitting in your side. And now I'm like, whoa. Some of those people I know from college and grad school. But that's the issue. But just because something looks like America doesn't mean it's represented. Six justices. Voted to overturn Roe versus Wade. That's two thirds. But at the same time, most Americans, most Americans say they're pro choice of some sort. So the court is not always in tune with America. And that's normal. That's normal. So here's something I want to point out. This also lands in my research. So that's why you get something. Eight of the nine current justices came directly from the U.S. Court of Appeals. U.S. US courts of appeals, it should be. Um, but we're in the Court of Appeals for the 11th circuit. It's actually collectively, it should be plural. Um, eight of the nine were on the next highest level of federal courts. This is the way the federal courts work. The trial levels district court, we're in the Northern District of Georgia, then the circuit court, we're in the 11th circuit, which is Georgia, Florida, and Alabama, and then U.S. Supreme Court. Eight of the nine came directly from the U.S. Court of Appeals, U.S. Courts of Appeals. Uh, Justice Kagan was never a judge. She was Solicitor General. That's the person who argues on behalf of the government in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. They're informally called the 10th Justice, or just 10th. <laughs> That's what they refer to the person as 10th. They are in front of the Supreme Court all the time. Justice Kagan was also a law professor at Harvard, and uh, dean of the Harvard Law School. And more importantly, she went to law school with President Obama. How's it get you? He's not the first person to do that. President Kennedy appointed a friend of his from, uh, he'd go to law school, but a friend of his who had gone to law school was his roommate. That was Justice Byron White, the only uh, NFL player to end up on the U.S. Supreme Court. Justice O'Connor was an appellate judge in Arizona. She was our, the first woman on the court. In the last 40 years, all but two of the justices came from the U.S. Courts of Appeals. So we know where they come from. I don't know if some of you are baseball fans. You know, baseball, they have the minor leagues just below that. Well, that's what they do. They have the minor leagues. All right, next slide. So, an art composer with scholarly sources and some political support. How about this? The president has to nominate somebody who's already on the U.S. Courts of Appeal. That's what usually happens, and that's what I studied. So, I think it's a really good idea. There are 179 judges, and they do most of the important cases in the country that the Supreme Court does. There are 179 of them. And so you could change the law and says the president shall appoint from among the active members of the United States Courts of Appeals a nominee for the U.S. Supreme Court. It's pretty simple. They could do that. The new justices have joint appointments. They have a Court of Appeals appointment and they return to only the Court of Appeals after a set number of years. You're on the Supreme Court for, we can decide. Most people say 20 years. And then you rotate off. Then you rotate. That's the idea. Rotation in office. Have any of you ever heard of the Anti-Federalists? Victor, you remember I did the Anti-Federalists? Yep. The rest of you Anti-Federalists? They said there should be rotation in office. You shouldn't stay forever. How many terms can a president serve? Two, right. Doesn't matter if they're consecutive or not. But a president, if you became president with, with less than two years left, you could do almost 10 years. One day short of 10 years. One day short. So it's one of the things. So the new justice will have joint appointment to return only to the Court of Appeals and then do rotation. So every president gets appointments, more or less. And the idea that's an apprenticeship. You're on another lower court and then you move up if you have merit. 
Let me ask any of you here. All right, this is some obscure academic proposal. But you think of that. Would it surprise you to know that in Georgia, we have judges in some areas who aren't lawyers? Yeah. In rural Georgia, they have a horrible time getting people to sit as city court judges. They have tickets and dog complaints and the like in small cases. Some of you may have grown up in that part of Georgia and they don't have to be a lawyer. But generally you say, well, judges should be lawyers. But, and also, wouldn't you expect somebody to be a judge in the highest court should have experience doing something similar? In the law? One of the great things you could do as undergraduates is do an internship in there. What's your major? Computer science. All right, good. So as you make real money. If you do poly science, what happens to you? You wear bow ties. You know, they talk about obscure things and the like. So please do an internship. Find out where computer science you want to be. I did an internship. I went to Capitol Hill. My parents always said, this is what you want to do. And the congressman told me at the end of it, uh, you're really good at this, but you probably want to teach. You don't want to make, you don't make laws. You probably got to study them. And he was right. That's why you do an internship. What's, what's, what's your name? What's, what's your halfway name? Okay, so yeah, definitely do that. A lot of people decide say, I want to do gaming. And one of our students here, he got an internship right around here gaming and said, that's not for me. I'm going to do computer science, but I'm not going to do that. So what's important is to do that. And that's the idea. Lawyers generally work for somebody they apprentice themselves. And that would be the length of the course. And that's sort of, for example, tradition of cooking for federal judges. All nine members of the United States Supreme Court clerked for a federal judge. That's what you do. You start out and go, hmm, maybe I ought to learn that. That's something that unfortunately has disappeared in our society, the idea of trying something out and learning. What's your major? It's a good liberal arts psychology. I like that. I like that. We've got some liberal arts. Yeah, and you've got to figure out. That's what I suggest. As long as you're at Georgia State or wherever, do an internship. Figure out what you might want to do. That's a good idea. Before you major in something you don't like, and like also trendy majors change. By the way, computer science has always been popular. When I was an undergraduate, yes, oh, it's yours, but yours, it's fine. Gas prices are really high like they were now. So you know what people were majoring in? Petroleum engineering. So where I went to school, people were majoring in petroleum engineering because gas prices were so high. When we, got out of, when we got out of school four years later, they had dropped by 30%. We might even see gas prices below $3 this year. That'd be good. We got it for four. So that's the problem. Don't major in what's trendy. Study what you love. This is stone philosophy. I'm going to, unfortunately, whenever I get in front of a student audience, I always try and do this. Major in what you love. Major in what you're interested in. You'll be more successful. Also, major in something we can get. That's always good. Even philosophers get jobs. Even philosophers get jobs. That kind of thing. But that's one of the things. But aside from that, let me once again run through. I think what we need to do, and there's scholarly support, I think what we need to do is change the system. So the president picks already know to appellate judges, already got a record, and they serve for, let's say, 20 years, and they, that way you have regular rotation. That way, by the way, people go, well, nobody ever gets three. Trump got three in four years. Jimmy Carter, way before you were born, Jimmy Carter, he got zero in four years. It happens. It happens. Barack Obama got two in the first four years, and then one more that he couldn't fail. George W. Bush had two. So that's the kind of thing. This would make it more predictable. And the idea, I think, that to create, whether you like the Supreme Court or not, we have to acknowledge that we're in a world where we basically are governed by laws made by the legislative branch, with input from the executive, potentially a veto, but anything important is resolved by nine unelected Americans who wear black robes. So maybe we ought to have a better way of selecting in the line. By the way, there have also been failed nominations in the past. Often it's when presidents nominate their friends. That happened when W, he nominated a friend of his, and the, she, it was, she was so unpopular she didn't even get submitted to the Senate. That's pretty bad. 
And Merrick Garland got blocked by the Republicans. So what I'd like to do, oh, Shannon, let me move over. I want the last, we'll do the last one. Next slide. There we go. Next slide. I want you guys to log in this and I want to ask, do you have any questions? Do you want to make any points? You once again listen to a wacky professor with ideas about changing things. And if you'd like to ask me about the court, I'm like, yes, sir. So if you look at this, you can more representative. It is becoming more representative of Americans in terms of what it looks like. But here's something I'm gonna say that is controversial. I'm probably getting some trouble for this. Just because people are different doesn't mean they have different political views. All right? All right. We operate on this assumption. It's deeply flawed. And it was it came about in the 60s that if you change what who people are, you get more women, you get non-whites, you get people who didn't grow up. Well, they don't look like me. They come from, you know, if you didn't have parents who were college age, you get a different thing. Yes, you do. The problem with courts is they're all lawyers. And if any of you have ever been to a law school class, if you're thinking about law school, you need to go. Talk about abuse. <laughs> and the kind of thing. Law school is not a lot of fun. I have a big vicarious law school. Uh, my, my first wife passed away. There's a scholarship for pre law named after her. Um, I, uh, I, we were married and she went to law school, so I got a vicarious law school education. Ugh. Yeah, so, so you know the pain. You know the pain. When she gets there, have a party like you wouldn't believe. Celebrate it because it's not fun. My father was a judge. My mother got the law school education. My parents had gone through that. My brother's a lawyer. A bunch of my family, my, uh, my parents divorced. My, uh, my dad married a woman who was a lawyer. And it's, just, it's all over. I, I broke the law. I was supposed to go to law school. So I commend you for that. That's the thing. Yes. To look white, to have that demographic representation, to be different helps. That doesn't necessarily do. look. Most members of Congress look like me, but they represent a much more diverse. That's part of the problem. Congress, but I can get on to that. It's one of my favorite branches too. <laughs> That's a good question. Other ones, those are, those are good. Anybody else got one? Please. I enjoy, I enjoy that one. Um, anybody else? Come on, somebody's got to have a question too. Like, why did you do this? Why did you come up with this thing? Um, because court packing is going to be an issue. Regardless of how the Democrats do in this election, the fact that the, that the Republican Party is managing so many appointments, they've been better at it than the Democrats, frankly. Their leader, Mitch McConnell, Senator from Kentucky, Senator McConnell is really good at running the Senate and the like. And is the Supreme Court often out of step with Americans? Oh, yeah. Think about it. Have any of you ever been to the U.S. Supreme Court building? Anybody? It's in Washington, D.C. It's right behind the Capitol. You've been there? It's a temple to justice made of marble and stone. If you ever tour it, it's hard to tour it these days. It is, it is freezing cold in there during the summer. You can hang sides of beef. I remember going there, in fact, it was 40 years ago. If I remember going in there, we walked in there, and I was with two other people. Both of them were lawyers. One's retired here in Georgia, the other North Carolina. Actually, there were three, there were four of us, all three of them were lawyers, not me. I'm the professor, they're all lawyers. And we, there was an old man who came up to us wearing a bow tie. And he said, welcome, gentlemen, why are you here? So we want to tour the court, sir. He said, well, that's good. I hope you enjoy. How many of you want to be lawyers? And they'll say they still have that delusion. And he said, well, that's good, and walked off. We didn't realize, but we had met Justice Stevens. We always wore a bow tie. We had no idea. He was a Republican, a conservative, but... As the court moved right, he ended up being the most liberal on the court when he retired. People stay a long time. He's appointed, he was only 55 when he was appointed. He served to about 85. He served forever. More than that, he served to almost 90, I think. Any more questions, folks? Yes, what is the, yeah. The results. What are the results? All right. Results. Whoops. Back. All right. And court picking for 26 responses. Oh, I guess I need to. Do I need to log in? Or should I have to go? Sure. I'm on the main. Avenue. 
All right. Can you get to these? Let's see. All right. Yes. Question three. Have you changed your mind? Yes. No. And maybe. Good. That was the point of this. Also, there's one more last point I want to make, and I promised I would shut up a little after two because a number of you have to get going, go to your other classes. <laughs> we govern ourselves. On the day the Constitution was signed, which was September 17, 1787, the remaining members, I think of 39, who were still there at the Constitutional Convention, which had run all summer through the heat in Philadelphia. If you've ever been to Philadelphia in the summer, you'll know why. They signed, and they started north. They started with the members from New Hampshire, and then the members of Georgia. And then they left. Ben Franklin, who acted as host, we have his records, especially his purchases of beer and wine and other alcohol and food. He fed all the members. Ben Franklin was hobbling down the steps in gout, and a woman comes up to him and he says, Dr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin, what kind of government have you given us? A monarchy or a republic? Monarchy just means we have a king. We didn't have a king. He said, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Our job is to keep our republic. We need to participate. We need to engage. Let's just start with voting. Those of you eligible, please register. Please vote. And that's the importance of Constitution Day is to remember. Not just this abstract, yeah, I've gone on in an abstract manner. Um, and I think we can improve the Supreme Court. I think if we had rotation in office, it would look more like us, and maybe it would be more reflective of what people want. There are those who would argue that courts are not supposed to reflect what the people want. Uh, we have one of those strange systems in Georgia where we elect our judges. So popular sovereignty is important. I want to thank you for your patience, and I want to thank you for being here and celebrating this with me. And I'm sorry we didn't get our, our alumnus. She, she may come next year. We'll see if we can get her. And I welcome you on the way out to grab cookies and other refreshments. Thank you all for your attention. And for my students and those online, I'll expect those papers. We'll talk about them more on Friday. Take care. And thank you, JP.